Hi, I'm Don Porter, and I'm a statistics professor in the Data Sciences Department at Marshall. I must say, it's rather hard to be a statistician at this moment in time during the COVID-19 pandemic. After parsing through the day's news, I find myself with more questions than I had before. During this short presentation, I hope to be able to make some sense of all the data and projections out there, but I will warn you that there is a lot that is not yet answered, and possibly not even yet asked about this pandemic. I'm sure everyone is familiar with all the websites and news sources that are readily available at our fingertips, being updated at the touch of a button. My goal is to explain some very common statistics being reported. What you'll come to see is that there are not only a lot of questions about data integrity, but any data can be shown from various angles. For example, there are models comparing the total number of COVID-19 cases reported in China. Starting around day 60 of known cases being discovered, there's been a fairly consistent linear trend of the total cases. You can see in the graph how straight the red trend line is. Of course, before then was a very different story. The statistics on the chart indicate a very good fit for the basic model, and each day since 60 has seen approximately 74 new cases being reported. In general, this amounts to about a 0.09% daily increase. In stark contrast, the pattern in the US follows more of an exponential trend. Also a reasonably strong model, the data here indicates that each day brings about 14% more total cases reported. Although it is true that China was possibly ahead of the US in terms of the virus outbreak and detection. Let's look at several different countries together to see how they compare with respect to the total number of confirmed cases. Notice the shift around mid-March, especially in the US. This is probably not surprising given the alarming numbers we hear about the spread in the United States. Is this the best picture to represent the differences between these countries? The eight countries vary quite a lot in many respects, one of which is size or population. This new graphic now incorporates a country's population size. The shift from the last graphic is most dramatic for Italy, Germany, France, and the UK. We already knew that the total count in the US was high, but so is its population. When scaled by size, the new perspective for the European countries is very striking. But are these differences purely due to country size? Let's assess one more measure before diving into the various pieces. The case fatality rate, or CFR, calculates the proportion of people confirmed with the virus who actually die from it. Sounds like a tricky thing to capture, doesn't it? Notice once again the large differences between the values for these countries. France has the highest CFR, at just over 18%, and South Korea has the lowest, at just over 2%. Are these countries so drastically different that their rates could vary by almost 16%? The answer to this is both simple and complicated. The simple explanation lies in the basic structure of the statistic itself. If either the numerator or the denominator isn't measured the same way or consistently, the CFR is immediately affected. Some factors that might influence these results are the timing of the outbreak of the onset. Deaths occur up to eight weeks after symptoms manifest, so this data is delayed. Demographics of a country's population. Availability and use of testing, including sample biases. Contact tracing. South Korea, for example, used cell phone data, enforcement or lack of social distancing measures, misallocating death cause, and different area resources, cultures, governments, and laws. But how could these pieces be measured so differently? Let's start with the numerator, or deaths from the virus. Many countries are still struggling to get accurate reporting of the deaths, especially those attributable to the virus. It's difficult to get an accurate count of COVID-19 deaths that didn't occur in a hospital setting. Research has actually compared the current overall death rates from all causes to a country's recent average from the last five years. After taking out the deaths known to be from the virus, there are huge gaps of unknown deaths. In fact, many European countries show an actual 20 to 30 percent more deaths than normal. Let's assess France, for example. France is currently experiencing an increase of about 32 percent. This results in about 14,500 more deaths than the average but only just over 8,000 of these have been officially attributed to COVID-19, leaving about 6,500 unexplained deaths. Yes, these could be from various other factors and conditions. Everything else being held constant though, this is a suspiciously large number. Now let's take a look at the CFR measured denominator, or the total number of confirmed cases of the virus. There's a lot of press around this number, as there should be given its importance. In order to locate confirmed cases, a lot of testing needs to be done but who is being tested? Once testing is done, the test positivity rate can be found. This is simply the percent of tested individuals who get a positive result. 
large differences are apparent, once again, between countries. The United Kingdom has over a 28% test positivity rate, whereas South Korea's rate is just under 2%. How can we get a handle on the prevalence of this virus with such variable results, and why is this happening? Countries are probably still testing only more extreme patients, those with a higher probability of infection. People who are asymptomatic or with mild symptoms may be drastically undercounted. The more testing that is done, the more uninfected people will be discovered, therefore leading to countries with lower test positivity rates. Some people even avoid doctors or never get sick enough to seek a test. They are being left out of the measure. Virus testing requires a plan for sampling individuals. The gold standard here is a version of random sampling, but this is much more difficult to implement than a convenient sample, where testing is done on readily available subjects. But shouldn't it be better to have some results from convenient samples rather than no data at all? As an example, the National Institute of Health wanted to study 10,000 volunteers for antibody testing. They found their volunteers through Twitter and other public postings and were then asked to email the NIH to enroll and be sent a home test kit. What are the potential biases in this approach? Certainly there is a self-selection bias. Only certain people have access to and the ability to browse internet sources, and only some people would be willing to, to participate in such a study. I highly doubt that this group of volunteers is actually a good representation of all citizens of the United States. The study may give a very clear picture of a certain type of individual, but are these people more or less likely to contract the virus? This approach is very dangerous, especially if we do not fully understand the extent of our biases in sampling. In the end, this might be actually worse than knowing nothing, if people think they've learned something from it. Why do various models get different results and change predictions so frequently? These models are merely indications of what is going on now, not to be assessed as true snapshots of the future. They describe a range of possibilities that are highly sensitive to changes. On March 16th in 2020, an epidemiological model from Imperial College in London projected that without drastic interventions, more than half a million Britons would die from the COVID-19 virus. Merely four days later, on March 20th, renowned scientist Neil Ferguson testified that he expected deaths in the UK to top out at about 20,000. That's a very large difference. Was this shift a remarkable turn? Or did Neil Ferguson have a, quote, patchy record in modeling, according to the British Daily Mail? One headline even stated, quote, the scientist whose doomsday pandemic model predicted Armageddon just walked back the apocalyptic predictions, says the Federalist. The original model actually lays out a range of predictions, from tens of thousands to 500,000 dead, all depending on how people react. Epidemics are especially sensitive to initial inputs and timing, and because epidemics grow exponentially. Let's take a look at models within the U.S., According to a widely respected model, U.S. COVID-19 deaths are predicted to reach about 67,641 by the beginning of August this year. But notice the shaded area around the projection. This indicates the level of uncertainty in the prediction. The model indicates that although the point prediction is 67,641 deaths, it is very likely that the ultimate result is somewhere between 48,558 and 123,517. This is a very large range, isn't it? It speaks volumes about how much is known and unknown about this virus. Precisely because of all the questions and uncertainty around this, a data integrity checklist has actually been developed. First, is there no data or is it just hard to find? Many countries are not yet providing official figures and often don't report on a regular basis. Data is often not easy to find. Do numbers refer to performed tests or individuals tested? It is common for COVID-19 testing that the same person is tested more than once. Some countries report tests performed, while others report the number of individuals tested. Are negative results included? Are pending results included? It needs to be clear whether or not figures for the total number of tests performed or the number of people tested include negative test results, as well as the number of tests that are pending results. Many sources report the number of individuals who are suspected or have been ruled out. To be reliably included in test counts, it needs to be explicit whether such categories reflect the number of people who are awaiting test results or have tested negatively. Do figures include all tests conducted in the country, or only some? 
Figures reported by countries may be only partial if not all laboratories are reporting to the central authority. Are all regions and laboratories within a country submitting data on the same basis? Answers to the questions above may vary from region to region. What period did the published figures refer to? Cumulative counts of the total number of tests should make clear the date from which the data begins. The key question that needs to be answered is whether the figures published at some date attempt to include all tests conducted up to that date. The reporting of tests can take several days, and for some countries, figures for the last few days may not yet be complete. Are there any issues that affect the comparability of data over time? If we want to look at how testing figures are changing over time, we need to know how any of the factors discussed above may have changed too. What are the typical testing practices in the country? Having a sense of how often and when individuals are tested can help the users of these statistics understand how estimates of tests performed and individuals tested might relate to each other. And last, might any of the information above be lost in translation? People accessing data published in a language in which they are not fluent may misinterpret the data by mistranslating the provided text, which often includes technical terms. After all of this, I'm sure you, like I, have remaining questions. In fact, a common caution in data analysis is garbage in, garbage out. What this means is that your data and results are only as good as what you put in. Some remaining questions I have. What's the attack rate? The number of people who get infected within an exposed group, like a household. Do people who recover have immunity? How widespread are asymptomatic cases, and how infectious are they? Are there super spreaders, people who seemingly infect everyone they breathe near, as they were with SARS, and how prevalent are they? What are the false positive and false negative rates of our tests? Once we have answers to some of these questions, I believe that we can get a good idea of how the virus progresses and what to expect in the future.